17 years after our victory in the Great War, a lot has changed, both domestically and abroad. We are of course still the masters of the world and we have served as the world police. However, cracks are starting to form. Unlike the revolution in Russia, the French and British syndicalists saw massive successes and kicked out the monarchy and republic to Canada and Algeria. The following years their ideology would slowly spread around the world. Fortunately, it hasn't affected us too much and we are instead threatened by nationalism. Despite forming the Central European Economic Union to try and become better friends with our puppets and allies in Europe, nationalists could still be threatening the stability of our Reichspakt. However, most of our problems lie domestically. After the Great War, Wilhelm II would revert to the authoritarian changes which had allowed for a military dictatorship during the war, instead changing our political system to a democratic constitutional monarchy. While it worked well for several years due to a consensus between the liberal and centrist parties, who then tactically cooperated with the right or the left in order to keep everyone content. It has now all collapsed. Due to several reasons there is no longer any coalition with the Chancellor unable to do anything. Fortunately elections are arriving in April which could fix this complete deadlock. On the economic level we have been a bit everywhere. After the war it would drastically slow down especially as world trade didn't relaunch as we had wished for due to civil wars all over the world. However the last few years our economy is doing great. Mittel Europa and the open doors in China due to the legation cities have greatly helped this. Additionally we are currently in the most profitable year yet as stock prices are soaring and money is flowing through the economy like a rapid. However while many believe these great times will continue forever the more educated are predicting an impending stock market crash. Especially if things were to go off in China. Hopefully this won't be an issue so why won't we take a look at the coming election instead. The projected results are that the SPD, the Social Democratic Party which have been in the opposition for some time now, will win the most seats but with no outright majority. Following them are the Centrum, the party which currently leads a minority government. But then the German Fatherland Party, a national populist and probably anti-democratic party, follows with 65 out of 223 seats needed for a majority. Campaigns have already started with the most interesting being how the SPD has turned towards the center in order to fight against the DVLP, cooperating with leftist candidates from both the LVP and Zentrum. What is it? Stop bothering me. Panic selling had erupted with stock prices plunging several percentage points. While the central bank immediately started preparing measures to slow it down it was too late. Soon the first casualties would emerge, the second largest bank collapsed dragging with them hundreds of companies to bankruptcy. And with no response from Berlin due to the struggling government, the crash will continue to escalate. However, some changes are forming in our politics. The Reichskanzler has resigned leaving Wilhelm to appoint the current minister-president of Prussia as new Reichskanzler. He will try to lead a non-partisan government all the way to the April elections. But the complete deadlock in the Reichstag endures as it is unable to gain a majority due to the opposition from non-Prussian representatives and thus the economic crisis continues to worsen with mass layoffs spreading throughout our nation. In addition it has started spreading to all corners of the world leading to big issues in our colonies as well as the dissolution of the Qing Empire. And this has allowed for the resurrection of the Kuomintang which we had fought so hard to get rid of. Naturally we don't have the resources to send any active fighting force, however since this is a national security matter and we wish to protect our investments we will send a small advisory mission and a thousand guns. Returning to our economic crash it had even reached our agricultural sector further escalating it to never before seen levels in German history. But eventually the free fall ceased having reached the bottom allowing us to begin working our way up again. 
But the work is enormous and the only possible way to complete it is after the April elections. So we waited. While we did, the Berlin election took place where the left-wing candidate from the SPD won showing how our nation takes a turn towards the left. And that was what happened in the elections too. The SPD gained 157 seats and some other leftist parties gained 8. Yet the opposite side, the DVLP, also grew, gaining 60 seats. This means that neither side has a majority, not even the more centrist parties. But we can't wait another 5 years to get a stable government, so the duty of appointing the new Reichskanzler falls on Wilhelm. He chose Kurt von Schlicher, the current Minister of War of Prussia, to lead a centrist coalition composing of all parties except the SPD, the far left and the DVLP. In his first speech before the Reichstag, he announced the biggest priority of his government. Fixing the economic crisis, more specifically putting an end to the massive number of unemployed since it's unemployment which hurts our population the most. However, with no majority, pushing through the required reforms will be hard. Especially if the SPD and the DVLP flood him with no confidence votes. To tackle this, a controversial first law was passed. Simply put, it changed the no-confidence vote to constructive no-confidence votes, meaning that only once a replacement candidate has gained the majority can the current Reichskanzler be deposed. This, of course, doesn't stop everything and Schlicher will still need to protect the coalition from attempts at destroying it. Still, work can at least begin. In order to defeat the crisis, we need to surpass the stagnation and economic decline with our investment and stability, all while keeping our debt below 200% to not default. We have several types of actions to succeed with this and they are all more or less effective depending on which crisis currently is the worst. For example, before the elections had even taken place, the Reichsbank had started printing more money since we found ourselves in a liquidity crisis. Then the economy entered a labor crisis and it urged the government to implement an employment program, which it did. And so the first wave of stagnation and decline was overcome. It all sounds simple, but as it continues it will become harder and harder, especially since we must keep our debt low. This is why the government must immediately start reforms to give us more cards in our deck and keep track of our debt. As promised, the government first focused on unemployment, creating the Freiwillige Arbeitsdienst, who will employ the jobless in labor-intensive work, such as infrastructure construction. While it was on its way, a vice-chancellor was chosen. After careful consideration, it was August Winning which was appointed, a member of the right wing of the SPD turning the government towards the left. Back to the economy, we had to spend a lot in order to pass the crisis, but we still succeeded due to the help from the Reichspakt and the establishment of price monitoring. Still, with workless people still being the norm, the popularity of syndicalism has started to rise, and consequently tensions are rising between the state and the supporters of the evil ideology. To maybe quell it before it gets out of hand, the government quickly continued the reforms, adopting the Plan Tarnov Bade. Two trade union leaders who proposed to vastly expand public works and other actions, largely following the stated goal of Schlicher. However, it will severely hurt our military and naval production. Still, due to this and the sale of weapons to Venezuela, the next turn against our crisis was easily passed. All the while, political changes in the relationship between parties picked up speed drastically. Schlicher would try his best to protect his coalition, but it wasn't enough as the Conservative Party joined the Coalition schwarz wies rot headed by the DVLP. Then, following chaos in the Centrum Party conference over who should be the next chairman, it partially broke up allowing the right wing to also join the DVLP coalition. In the end, the progressive would become chairman of the party, spelling an uncertain future for the second biggest party. And it also started the struggle for Schlicher to keep power as both the SPD and DVLP are moving closer towards the 223-seat majority they need to initiate a vote of no confidence.
But just as he thought he would have the breathing room to start to secure his government by defending and forging new alliances since the economic recovery was doing good, the troubles with syndicalism would explode. Due to industrialists in the Ruhr refusing to negotiate with the trade unions, a general strike was called engulfing eastern Rhineland in flames. Despite curtailing the distribution of the biggest syndicalist newspaper, the strikes continued to spread with the Rhenish and Westphalian workers joining as well. While the strikes will hurt our economy, they also risk to hurt Schlicher politically as the SPD have supported the strikes while the right call for extreme measures. Trying to take the middle path, he established curfews and got the few loyal unions left to spring into action with propaganda. Still, the strikes continued to spread and he quickly prepared to escalate the suppression. Unfortunately, some far-right members escalated it too much, killing two union men. After much pressure from the SPD, Schlicher agreed to compensate the families of the victims, something which would turn the strikes away from syndicalism towards the SPD. And this is exactly what the party wanted. Schlicher had fallen into the trap as the centrist and leftist parts of the Zentrum joined sides with the SPD to give their Demokratische Union a majority in the Reichstag. And after convincing the Kaiser that Hermann Müller, leader of the SPD, would handle the strikes better together with a successful no-confidence vote, Müller formed the first truly democratic government. And so work begins to implement the vast ambitions that the SPD went to election with, because failure to do so could spell the end of the government. But first, the strikes had to be dealt with. The intensity had already shrinked, so a few selective reforms together with promises to implement all of SPD's planned changes were enough to end the strikes and end the state of emergency in the Rhineland. However, it was too late for us to stop the Belgians from declaring independence. While we could have declared war, the Kaiser decided not to due to our economic crisis. And about the crisis, we are lucky that the new government has decided to follow the previous, continuing with the plan Tarnov Bade by establishing price controls and further continuing the creation of jobs. But one thing they did that Schlicher didn't was to start caring about our debt as it has started growing. Then, in the end of November, we had to start looking outside of Germany as a civil war had started in Spain. And unlike the one in China, the Kingdom of Spain, which Carlists and Syndicalists are revolting against, are a part of Mitteleuropa. So Kaiser Wilhelm immediately sent Manstein with his two panzer divisions and two infantry divisions to aid restore stability in the country. Almost immediately our forces met French light tank divisions. In the south we won a battle against them, allowing us to enter southern Valencia. However, we left it to try and encircle some syndicalist forces, but sadly due to our Spanish allies starting to crumble, the attack failed. Horrifyingly, it wasn't only in the south that they started to crumble as Madrid had fell to Carlist forces. However, we will put our trust in Manstein that he can turn this around and so we returned our focus back home where a lot of new things to do have popped up. Despite a big revolt in Ukraine, the economic healing around Mitteleuropa has allowed the Union to return back into action. And thus our government will need to begin work on reforming it into the SPD's vision. At the same time, due to the growing tensions throughout the world, the army has demanded that attention is put into reforming and strengthening our fighting force. However, both these issues are only secondary as the SPD are still putting their focus on the economy and their reforms. They have for example nationalized all railways, completed the construction of a major dam and initiated civil service reforms, one of their promises. After this and the preparations to cartelize our economy, it was doing great as we could easily match the crisis with our investment and stability. This meant the government could focus on our secondary issues, starting with Mitteleuropa. So far it has mostly been organized to oppress and keep our nation as the world leader. However, the SPD seeks to change this and transform it into an organization for cooperation. Due to its slow system, reforms will take time, but that's why we start now. We will begin with trying to introduce commission directives, basically mandatory guidelines. 
Then, with world tension growing as the Second American Civil War has started and the conflict with the French over Switzerland, which we won, leading to the Swiss joining the Reichspact, we will begin some military reforms. Starting by reforming our doctrines, because after winning the Great War they have turned outdated. Which we can see in Spain, because despite encircling some divisions, we have been pushed back hard. Sadly, we couldn't spend much time on this, since trouble had started in Prussia. Their conservative government, opposed to the SPD, have refused any negotiations with the federal government, which has led to no budget being adopted, severely hurting our economy, as well as paralyzing the federal government through their resistance. We immediately started work on defeating the rebellion, starting by contacting an old enemy of the SPD, Schlicher. Despite their rivalry, he gladly accepted to claw back some power, becoming the minister-president of Prussia. This made our coming negotiations far simpler. We gave a lot of support to Zentrum's Adenauer, who successfully convinced some lords in the Prussian House of Lords to reconsider their positions. We also successfully negotiated with the Prussian liberals, and finally after a victorious boycott which paralyzed most Prussian institutions, the conservatives agreed to negotiate a budget restoring stability and economic growth. However, while we might have won now, the conservatives still have Prussia as their stronghold. And this isn't because they are popular, but because of the unfair plural voting system. To fight this, the SPD has created the Constitutional Review Committee, who will be tasked with drafting major reforms of the constitution. But right now, their main goal is to pursue equal suffrage in Prussia to crush the conservative stronghold. Fortunately, the reforms were successful, however it costed us Schlicher's loyalty as he instead joined the opposition who have escalated their efforts to try and topple the SPD government. To defend it, we formed the Front in Defense of Democracy and using a lot of our political power, we could topple Schlicher and enact Prussian civil service reforms, taking away power from the conservatives. To be honest, their efforts at removing the SPD were easily destroyed as the party is now more popular than ever. So we had the time to take a look around the world once again. In Spain things had calmed down a bit, but close to us in Austria everything changed. After the Austrians started a process to centralize power, the Czechs revolted, followed by Galicia and Illyria. The Romanians and Serbians would also take the opportunity to recapture much of their territory. Fighting five nations all alone, the Austrians would soon collapse and descend into anarchy. While we lost a powerful ally due to this, it would actually strengthen us more than anything so far as the Austrians voted to join our nation, which we gladly accepted and Hungary and Czechoslovakia both joined the Reichspakt, as well as Poland gaining Krakow and Lvov. This not only strengthened our position in the Balkans, but it greatly helped our economy, which was now close to be fully healed, allowing us to turn to our secondary objectives. Starting with Mittel Europa once again, the Commission directives have been voted on and were now being introduced, with the second reform also entering discussions. Then we moved to our army where Thyssen was hired as advisor and started construction of far more military factories to rearm our army. However, arms are nothing without a good doctrine, so we continued developing ours. And we've already seen how it can be successful, because in Spain Manstein had abandoned the Carlist front putting all our efforts on our actual enemy, the syndicalists. This allowed him to break through and reach all the way north to Barcelona and Zaragoza, capturing their leadership and forcing them to surrender. But after this we had to retreat our volunteers as the Carlists would surely win with their much bigger army. Still having defeated the syndicalists, this is a major victory. Then the best news we have ever heard arrived. The economic crisis is gone. Employment and productivity is restored with investment flowing just like in a healthy economy. This means one thing, we can prepare much better for war because the Tarnovbade plan is over. And we really need to because in our west the French and British are preparing for war and in our east the Russian national populists are also seeking revenge for the great war. Since our eastern allies will be fighting the Russians head first, we will help them with the construction of forts. 
Then back home we expanded our war schools, started researching better rifles and began to aid the reformisten in our army, a group of generals who seek to transform the Heer into a professional fighting force. For example opening the doors to our war schools to everyone not only nobles. A little more than a year later we had come a long way in our preparations, deploying new panzer divisions, enacting limited conscription and early mobilization. However, we hadn't forgotten about our navy and air force. In both areas we followed the reformistens plan, which means offensive support and long-range bombing for the air and an aggressive and fire-happy fleet. We had also continued the democratization of Mittel Europa as well as further continuing the SPD's reforms. Then the 10th of March 1940 the French crossed the border and killed 19 of our local patrols. While this was no official declaration of war we all knew what was about to go down. One month later it happened, the third international together with the Russians declared war. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video where the future of our German nation and all of Europe will play out.